welcome to Louisiana Humanities Center. My name is Brian Boyles. We are so happy to have all of you here for the final event in our Fall 2013 program series. If you haven't already, please do uh, sign our mailing list. Before I, I move further, I should uh, ask for a round of applause for two Louisiana companies who have supported us all year round. They really have been the fuel to making all of this work a beat of beer and Zap's potato. <laughs> Um, joining Stephen and I tonight, and I want to thank Stephen again. It was great, great, great to see that film. Uh, on Stephen's right, Dr. Alicia P. Long is an associate professor in the Department of History at LSU. She received her PhD from the University of Delaware and is the author of The Great Southern Babylon, Sex, Race, and Respectability in New Orleans, 1865 to 1920. She was co-editor with Leanne Weitz and authored an article in the volume Occupied Women, Gender, Military Occupation, and the American Civil War, which was published by LSU Press in 2009. Dr. Long is currently writing a Louisiana history text that will be published in 2015 for use in the state secondary schools and is also at work on a biography tentatively entitled American Clay, The Secrets, Identities, and Life of Clay Laverne Shaw. Please welcome Dr. Long. Rosemary James is on my right. She's had a dual career in communications and interior design. Her career in New Orleans journalism began in 1964 with the state's item where she covered the maritime and oil and gas industries before being assigned to cover District Attorney Jim Garrison's office, the courts, and politics. With two other reporters at the state item, she broke the story that Garrison was investigating the Kennedy assassination and arrest by Garrison of businessman Clay Shaw. In 1968, she moved to WWL-TV, where she again covered primarily the courts and politics, including the trial of Clay Shaw. In advance of that trial, she co-authored the nonfiction book, Plot or Politics, centering on the investigation. She is the co-founder of the Pirates Alley Faulkner Society and the creator of Words and Music, a Literary Feast in New Orleans. She and her husband uh, were recipients of a Lifetime Achievement Award from the Louisiana Endowment for the Amenities. Please welcome her today. Stephen, I want to start um, with you. Um, when did you know that you were going to make a, a documentary film out of a particular story, and, and how did you get started? Because wa watching the film, it seems like the f I would have gone to Mandina's first. You know? <laughs> but I wonder, you know, when it hit you that this was something you were going to make a film out of, and, and, and what your first steps were. I, I remember very specifically. I mean, it was short. And, and in 1968, when I was 13 years old, I saw 2001 A Space Odyssey and decided I wanted to be a filmmaker. Uh, but uh, right around the same time, uh, Shaw was arrested. So when Shaw was arrested in 67, I was 12 years old. It was the first story that I, that I was old enough to really follow with any kind of level of sophistication on TV and in the news, newspaper. And it was also, I vividly recall having this sort of epiphany that New Orleans is not like any other city. <laughs> when I was 12 years old, I, you know, that had never occurred to me before. But when this, this sort of uh, you know, menagerie of characters was paraded before the, the, the press and the newspapers, you know, uh, David Ferry, <laughs> Dean Andrews, uh, Jim Garrison, you know, Guy, Guy Bannister, sure, absolutely. Uh, I, Clay Shaw, I, I don't, I'm quite confident growing up in a Southern Baptist house, I probably never heard the word homosexual before. And I, I definitely remember thinking Shaw was this really, really mysterious figure. And then you would hear all these rumors about him, like, you know, like he, was, he, was, he was a quadroon. And I don't think I probably hadn't heard that word before. Octoroon, mm -hmm. actually. Octoroon, okay. <laughs> all, all the air of mystery around him. So, uh, when I became a filmmaker, and uh, sometime later, I uh, had the opportunity to uh, apply for a grant from LEH, uh, I came up with the idea that this was a sort of quintessential New Orleans story. And to, uh, to LEH's credit, they, uh, they agreed with me and helped fund the film. So that's more or less how it happened. We often hear, uh, when talking about Jim Garrison, you'll hear people say, he was a genius, or that he was insane, that he was a charlatan, or that he was really a great thinker um, of his time. Rosemary, I, I wonder if you could tell us a little bit more about 
Jim Garrison before this period because he's, he's elected in 1961. Um, it, as an assistant DA, he's thought of as sort of a colorful character and then he and becomes this reformer and, and really takes on um, corruption and has much higher profile. I think um, it was Governor McKithen in the, in the film talked about this just wasn't what a DA in New Orleans did. If you can step out of the, uh, of the, the Shaw trial, and, and can you tell us a little bit more about what your idea of Garrison was before he got into this? Well, he was all of the things you said. He was bright, he was charming, he was, uh, he could charm the birds out of the trees when he wanted to. Um, he was a lunatic, and he was a charlatan. Um, even before this case came before um, the public, he had represented a lot of the working girls on Bourbon Street, and yet when he wanted to gain headlines, he would haul them in, and uh, as soon as the headlines died down, he'd let them out. Uh, you know, he was never serious about any of that stuff. He was always out to get a name for himself. That's the best way I can describe it. Um, he was a brilliant thinker uh, in many respects, uh, but he was lazy. He told Iris Kelso uh, one time, we went to see him when he was suffering from his uh, bad back and he was in the hospital. We went together. Iris worked for one television station, I worked for another, but we both started out on the state side and we were best friends. And, <clears throat> can you hear me now? Yes, it's okay. much better. <laughs> um, he said, I feel so lazy sometimes, I feel like I can't do a thing in this whole world except lie in bed until I get to feeling like an amoebic uh, blob. <laughs> and when I get to feeling like an amoebic blob, I can finally drag myself out of bed and do something. He would start off on all these tangents, uh, usually, and then get bored. I think one of the tragedies in, in reference to Jim Garrison personally about this case was that this was uh, a situation that seemed exciting to him, that might propel him into greater glory. Uh, but he got bored, and, and unlike other um, similar instances with him, he didn't get bored with this, and I think he finally went around with Ben in terms of his mental health. <coughs> Alicia, the, the Quote I, uh, that I'm, I'm not a, s a scholar of the, of the assassination or what's going on around it, but I know that um, one thing Norman Mailer said about Oswald was that in some ways Oswald was this remarkable person as JFK, is the things he, that, he, that he went through in order to ever become Oswald were just out, outlandish and, and surprising. As you look at Clay Shaw and, and start to uncover more things, he, he, through the film, seems like a fascinating character. Everyone on the uh, film talks about him with you know, high esteem, even if they're talking about him in a negative way. Um, what are you finding out about him that, that, that maybe makes a little more sense of why he would have gotten in these crosshairs in the first place? If, even if we build in that the Garrison was on to something else and there were these coincidences, what is it about Clay Shaw that, that, that gets him into this mess? I would say I've been lucky to spend a significant amount of time in the National Archives going through the papers related to this case, both the donated papers of Clay Shaw, but also Jim Garrison's investigative files. And um, Garrison's investigative files are full of, even now, um, photographs and mug shots of people who were vulnerable in some way or the other, um, particularly gay men. And, um, and so there were, are some notations on some of those cards, new Clay, follow up. Um, and, and so, at core, it was Clay Shaw's homosexuality that made him vulnerable. It was illegal at that time to be a homosexual. Um, and even though it is now federal law that, you know, sex between consenting adults is not illegal, um, you know, we know that the sheriff in Baton Rouge still arrests people for that. Um, so, you know, New Orleans, despite that reputation for New Orleans being sort of an open community, this is a period of time when gay men are routinely brought in just for associating in public. And so this was not, as much as New Orleans had liberal communities of people, um, homosexual people were vulnerable. And I think at heart, that's what made him vulnerable. Um, and as much as 
Garrison and others would go out of their way to say that they tried very hard not to sort of um, focus on these aspects of the case. It runs as a subtext all through the testimony in the case. Um, and it certainly runs through the way that he was treated um, as a public figure, um, despite denials to the contrary. And you know, of course, uh, Garrison was big on contradicting himself over time. And, and by the way, uh, Perry Russo was also sexually vulnerable, um, as were people in his circle. And um, you know, to their credit, some young men who there are what we might consider erotic photographs of in the National Archives today refused to testify testify, even though Garrison tried to pressure them to do that. Um, so at core, I think it was his sexual preferences and um, the legal vulnerability that that put him under. Did having to, to live the life of, of a gay man while also being a, a civic father in a lot of ways, did it lead him into situations where he might have been in touch with people that, that again, made it more vulnerable in that way? I mean, or is that just Garrison going after as many people that are as vulnerable as possible? In other words, does having to live sort of an underground life in that way put you into contact with people who have an air of criminality? Well, I mean, to the degree that that sort of sexual behavior is criminal, yes. And, and, yeah. and he also, one of the things I found this summer when I went, I've been through his papers a couple times, but this summer I took a lot of time just going through his papers again. And one of the things that I'm very fortunate that are there are receipts from uh, the bookstores and books he was buying, um, particularly in 1963. Um, and he's reading what is being published by um, gay writers um, during this period of time, and he's reading about um, certain kinds of sexual practices. Um, so he's, he's reading this sort of erotic material, you know, about gay hustling and, and, and about these kinds of activities. And, you know, to the degree that those things made a person vulnerable, yes, I mean, he was, those were his sexual preferences. Um, so, I, I mean, I think I'm answering that question. Well, let me say something, too. Um, you know, it's, he was very prominent in the business world, and so he was doubly vulnerable uh, because you didn't go around telling people you were a homosexual in the 60s. It just wasn't done. Most of Clay's he, uh, friends who knew him fairly well knew that he was gay, but he certainly didn't make any open proclamations mm -hmm. about it. Uh, there was a great deal made about the whips and chains uh, taken out of his, his house. In fact, his mother told us that, and a lot of people in the quarter knew this anyhow, that every year, uh, most years at Mardi Gras, he went as a, um, a Spanish inquisitor. Uh, and, and that these were part and parcel of his Mardi Gras costume. So sexual preferences aside, you know, Garrison made a, a great deal about things that were taken out of his house which in fact were intended to inflame the public. There's no, no other reason for them to have shown all of that to the media. By the way, I was just at the National Archives. I must have just missed you. It's for assassination researchers, uh, the National Archives is Mecca. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, there's also uh, one of the many stories, like many of the stories surrounding this case, probably apocryphal, but uh, well, there always were these titters about Garrison being sexually. Uh, or I don't think they were just titters. Ambivalent <laughs> himself, and even to the point to where he and Shaw had had some sort of rivalry that uh, that Shaw had won, a rivalry for for young man's affections. But again, probably. I think that was probably uh, apocryphal. But there was uh, <clears throat> there was a situation between Clay Shaw and Garrison. Uh, Clay Shaw was a great friend of Ella Brennan's and regularly had dinner with her at Brennan's uh, in the days when Ella was uh, running Brennan's on Royal Street. And it was also well known by members of the media, you didn't write about these things uh, uh, at that time, that Garrison slapped his wife around a lot. He was a, a, an abusing husband. And one night in Brennan's, um, Garrison and Liz, uh, were there, and he started uh, a big argument, a big row with his wife, slapped her, threw wine on her, and Clay got up and asked that they leave. Uh, he was trying to help Elizabeth, but at the same time um, help his friend Ella by uh, having this embarrassment continue. And Garrison uh, said some comments about he was going to get him after that, 
So, I mean, that's a trivial thing, except that it sticks in the mind of somebody who is on the paranoid side of things anyhow. And also, Garrison, it's very well known in New Orleans that Garrison uh, uh, assaulted a, a minor boy at the New Orleans Athletic Club, a young man from a very prominent family. Uh, and nothing was ever reported in the press about this because of the age of the young man, uh, because it was not a consensual thing. <clears throat> in fact, Garrison should have been arrested uh, in, that, in that particular instance. Today, I'm sure he would have been, but the Jack Anderson reported in his national column, but still nothing ever, ever really came of it. Well, it was reported several, where, uh, several places, but the name of the young man was never reported. And I happen to know was, who it was. Yeah, it was kept out of the New Orleans papers, right. for sure. I mean, that, that column did not run in the New Orleans papers. And I've spoken to the young man directly. Yeah. He's a friend of a friend, and he says, yeah, it's all true. So. Well, it seems like a lot of this story is has the hallmark almost of New Orleans' a small town quality, mm -hmm. that there are connections that are made between very unlikely people right. that can then lead to conspiracies. I, I thought that James Phelan's quote at the end about, you know, looking at the city the way he did was interesting, especially today in a time when this is a city that's sort of constantly toasted in, 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 the, in the national media and is used to almost the national spotlight. As an event, how does it um, how does it reflect on s local culture, I guess, and, and the way that the New Orleans know each other and the secrets that we keep, and how that manifests itself in, 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 a, in a political realm? Well, it's my strong belief that New Orleans is unlike other American cities in almost every way. Uh, part of it has to do with its uh, very ethnic background first French, then Spanish, then French again, and then waves of other uh, immigration. Um, we just did a great series on that. Yeah, and it's, it's the only other city that even comes close to uh, New Orleans um, and, and exceeds it, it of course, is, is New York. And then Boston has the Irish, but they don't have the st uh, same strange mix that New Orleans has. So that's the first part of, of the, the recipe that uh, ends up being New Orleans, uh, the ethnic uh, blend and the resulting to sort of strange tolerance people have here for uh, the other, uh, people who are different. There's more tolerance here than there is in most communities in this country. We're not homogenized. Uh, we're different. We're very different. Um, and so if somebody new and different comes in, it's not going to prompt the whole community to get up in arms. So you've got a, a funny mix of strangeness, tolerance, and because probably of the heat, there's a, a little bit of, um, um, not apathy, that's not the right word, but um, I'll think about that tomorrow, you know, a, a little bit of that. And, uh, and the fact, and the end thing is that it's a in my opinion, the thing that makes New Orleans really unique is that it's a living theater. Every day, people are on stage here. They have no hesitation whatsoever to reinvent themselves <laughs> 10 times in a month or 10 times in a week. Uh, you know, I've told several friends of mine, I didn't even recognize you. You were so different in the way you talked, the way you looked, the way you dressed. Everything about you was different. Uh, it's Carol Flake who wrote a marvelous book about New Orleans. Uh, I think it's the subtitle of it is uh, Behind the Mask of uh, uh, America's Most Interesting City. And she said in that, and I really agree with her, that nobody in New Orleans wants to be thought ordinary in such an extraordinary city. And I think that she hit the nail on the head. And Garrison was no different than anyone else. He was just a little bigger than life. Um, you know, first of all, his stature, he was big, but he kept reinventing himself every day. And the Clay Shaw case was a prime example of that. The whole investigation that he mounted, every day he had a new theory. It wasn't 
that he had one theory all the way through and he just couldn't prove it. He kept coming up with a new theory every day. It got to be a joke. We called it, well, he's calling a press conference. It's the, the theory du jour is coming. <laughs> uh, you know, one day it would be 14 Cubans shooting from the storm drains of Dallas. You know, and then there was always, you know, one crazy thing after another. And so, yes, after a while, people in the media started to suspect that, you know, this was absolutely a witch hunt. His name wasn't even Jim. Jim was a fictitious name that he gave himself. How does that idea of tolerance, though, run counter maybe to what you're talking about as far as the vulnerability? Well, I was, I was going to say, you know, as a person who loves New Orleans and adopted it as my home, it's painful to hear James Phelan say something like that. But as a historian of Louisiana, I would say, yes, Jim Garrison was one of a kind, but he's also one of a type of um, politicians who run roughshod over people's civil rights. And sometimes that tolerance also sort of blends over into people letting things like that happen. Exactly. And, and, and so, I mean, I, I would just sort of add that as, you know, to what Rosemary said, that he, he's in the tradition of a lot of Louisiana politicians who intimidate people and get rid of people who, um, you know, cross you cross it, right? And so th that's all I would add to what Rosemary said. Yeah, you know, they start out as great populist, mm -hmm. and then they end up being great. Well, uh, and he had a lot of public support, right. you know, an enormous amount of public support. At the time when I made the film, uh, I really liked the quote of uh, Thalen to which you refer, because I thought it, it sort of encapsulated what I was trying to say, but the more I look at it over the years, the more patronizing it appears to me. Uh, well, it's certainly patronizing in, if you look at it as far as a critique of a justice system, and as you said, there's other justice systems that have similar flaws. Um, but there was an eerie quality in what he said that I thought was somehow related to maybe an outside view of New Orleans, too. Well, I, I do think that uh, a lot of people who don't live here and don't get, you know, the full sense of New Orleans, which includes all the good things too, uh, do think that this is a weird place. <laughs> I know. I've had lots of my friends uh, who don't live here say, how can you stand to live in that place? Uh, you know, uh, for one reason or another. But they don't understand that there is a sort of rhythm to life here that is very special. What is this case, those, I mean, he is a, maybe a DA that is like other DAs, but the fact that a public official stands up and, and says the federal government is lying, is this the first time this happens since, since 1963? Is it, is it that monumental of a statement that he's making at that time? Steve? Uh, I'm not a historian, but I believe it, it's significant. Well, he, I mean, he's following on the heels of um, Mark Lane in particular, and the movie Rush to Judgment which is the movie of Mark Lane's book, which came out the year before, it comes out in 1966. So there's, there are doubters on record um, when Garrison comes out with his investigation. And, and also, interestingly, he does, in fact, have a conversation with Senator Russell Long, right, whose own father was assassinated and or killed under unusual circumstances. So there's a sort of longer um, connection there. Garrison is the first person to do what he did as a public official, and, and that is true. I mean, and you know, for good or for ill, that's that's certainly the case. But there were doubters on record at that point, and some of them had received an enormous amount of publicity by the time he as a public official goes on record. Garrison had a, a wonderful platform because the Warren Commission did not do a good job. They left too many questions and unanswered, and maybe because they wanted to uh, allay the fears of the public. They wanted to get something out there right off the bat to say that, no, this was not Russia going, you know, attacking the U.S. through the president. They wanted to dispel some of those fears. And, but in the end, they did a disservice by not taking longer, doing a more thorough investigation, answering all the questions properly. Uh, so they left an opening. I mean, Russell Long said that he did not agree with the Warren Commission's uh, report because they didn't do a good job. He was very unsatisfied, and he's the one that started Garrison on this investigation. They were riding on a plane uh, coming back from Washington, and they started talking about the Warren Commission, and Russell Long said to Garrison, you know, you really ought to look into this. You, you 
as a, the district attorney of New Orleans have jurisdiction in this matter because Lee Harvey Oswald was born in New Orleans. And so you can blame it all on Russell Long. He's the one that gave the idea. <laughs> Following up on Oswald being the only, really the only figure in the story who was a Native New Orleans Indian, or certainly the key figure, if there's a uh, consensus among what I consider the serious JFK assassination researchers, and it's not an oxymoron, they really are scholars who, who take it very seriously. The one thing they agree upon is that the five or six months that Oswald spent in New Orleans in the uh, spring and summer of 63 remains the most unanswered aspect of, of the assassination. We still don't know what he was really doing. If he was, if he was truly a, a Marxist, polemicist, a uh, rabble rouser, or was he uh, a right wing government agent? There's evidence to support both theories, and, and I think. Well, he kept switching. <laughs> right. Right. He kept reinventing himself, yeah. as yeah. everybody else in New Orleans. <laughs> uh, Alicia, did Clay Shaw leave a, a, a written record of his experience and, and what he did with his life for you know, the succeeding years after that? Yeah, and uh, Sharon Litwin actually thought for a period of time about publishing a book about it, and she was not able to do that. She donated her papers to HNOC. And then later, um, uh, Clay Shaw had several men who were important for long periods of time in different parts of his life, and um, the partner of one of those men um, donated all of his papers to the National Archives. That's how his papers wound up in the Kennedy assassination papers. Um, but he kept a diary for a part of the time that um, this on, particularly between 67 and 69. Um, but his papers are voluminous, and there's an enormous amount of correspondence in those, and so they're the kind of things that historians like. I mean, there's a, there's a big documentary record, and he's a person who's on the public record um, very frequently. So, um, yeah, I mean, there's, there's I mean, you, you How get does he resolve books. himself to this situation? Yeah, I've learned based on the things that he's reading, he's very interested in psychology, and popular psychology, and he did a lot of reading about those things. So he's trying to figure out for himself what's happening to him, and he keeps trying to put it in different kind of historical contexts and comparisons. And so he's he's very aware of sort of larger comparisons. He talks about the Dreyfus case, and he kind of compares things that are happening to him to sort of Kafkaesque novels. And he he's um, you know he's trying to make sense of it, and he's trying to make sense of it in part in a literary way because that's what he was interested in. It's one of his you know great loves and avocations is literature and playwriting, and and so. You see a person trying to come to terms with what's happening to him um, in ways that are, um, you know, often very painful to read somebody sort of working through those kind of things. I mean, I think that really was devastating for him. And, and I would also say there's a longer legal record. I mean, cases related to the stay open until 1978 and are only ultimately abated by the United States Supreme Court. And that longer legal record around this is not very much explored, but has an enormous amount of contemporary resonance. So I would say there's, you know, there's a lot of historical record there that still can be explored fruitfully, I think. How does he re-enter New Orleans society at this point? Well, as Alicia has alluded to earlier, Clay Shaw had planned his life so that he had amassed not a great fortune, but enough money to live a comfortable life he was planning to retire early and, and finish out his life writing. And he had accumulated some property. He had uh, money in the bank. He, you know, he was in a very comfortable position. Um, this case ruined him financially. And it's not because his lawyers charged him a lot of money for their services, but the cost, just the legal costs were incredible. Um, all those trips that they, the defense had to have people take to investigate these witnesses, for example, um, and it just piled up and piled up and piled up, and uh, and the court costs were considerable. So, and I, I happen to know that that both Diamond and the Wegmans charged him very little compared to what they normally got in fees uh, for this particular case because they were so appalled by it. Uh, but uh, he, he, I think he kind of just gave up, if you want to know the truth. That's, he, he gave up the 
the house that he liked so much. It was not big or fancy. It was a small carriage house, but he had it furnished exquisitely, and he really loved the place. He gave that up, and he gave up, sold a lot of properties to satisfy the legal debts. He, um, he moved into uh, uh, one property that he kept, uh, which was on St. Peter Street, and it was a very nice Creole cottage, but I don't think it was the home of his heart. And I think that that, and then he discovered that he was sick. And you know what they say about cancer patients, that if they, if they have a will to survive, frequently they will. Uh, I think that he just didn't any longer have the will. I think he felt ruined. Um, he, he wasn't um, mean to anybody ever. You know, he didn't uh, go around talking uh, and saying horrible things about Garrison in the aftermath of this. He lived the rest of his life very quiet. Mm -hmm. Stephen, you titled it, you must have something. Whether or not he had anything on Clay Shaw, what do you think the ultimate contribution of Garrison's attack on the Warren Commission is to our understanding of his assassination attempt? Was there anything that came out of it that you think substantially contributes to a better understanding of what happened? Actually, yes. And that is, uh, although it has, its flaws are manifold, his uh, memoir written in 1988, I believe, on the trail of the assassins, uh, was, was the source for Oliver Stone's moving JFK. And when JFK came out, that created this uh, maelstrom of, uh, was, I guess legislation was, was, was enacted that created the Assassination Records Review Board, which uh, empowered uh, different jurisdictions to, to, to uh, interview people, and it led to release of documents that probably never would have been released before, thousands of documents. So if nothing else, that's, that's the benefit of the dynamic of Garrison. His memoir leading indirectly, if not directly. Well, there's an alternative side to that, too, though, of course, because he made such a mess of it. He made such a mess of his case that it pretty well would deter any other district attorney in any other district from doing the same thing. I think, in a way, he, he really put us in a position that we may never really know what happened. I think that Lee Harvey Oswald was in Dallas and the day that Kennedy was assassinated and probably had something to do with it and probably even shot him. But I don't think he got there by himself. I agree. I agree. I think one of the things that's come to light is, is that uh, I, I think the only sort of intellectually honest, at least speaking for myself, conclusion you can, you can come to is, to is to be an agnostic about the assassination. <laughs> uh, because it's a good way to put it. Because, Garrett, because uh, Oswald may or may not have been part of the conspiracy, but what has been revealed in subsequent years is that there are a lot of there were a lot of people running around manipulating him, people saying that they were he. Um, because look at the what a, what a, what a profile made for a spook. Here's this former U.S. Marine, not Army, not Navy, not Coast Guard, a Marine who defects to the Soviet Union and then comes back. I mean, different people in the, in, the, in the intelligence communities were just all over the, his persona, his his character, and manipulated it. I mean, I, I would just say, as a historian, I'm a creature of evidence, and I, I mean, the evidence is mixed, and some of these questions we are not gonna have evidentiary answers to, and so these things do come down to often a matter of people's belief. And, and so, you know, kind of my response is, you know, to Stephen's, Title, you know, he must have something more, and sort of as a historian, I think there must, or he must have something, and sort of I sort of think, well, there must be something more in the way that we approach these questions, because if you're watching TV the last two or three days, people are arguing about the same things they've been arguing about for 49 years, and you know, was was there one sugar or were there three? Was there, I mean, people are asking the same questions, and I think 50 years down the road, I think we can start to approach these things in a different way and ask questions, maybe that will get us. A different place, maybe not further necessarily down a road that's blocked, but a sort of way to think about these things in a context forward <coughs> way and to sort of make more sense about what happened to people, all those people. I think that is one of the best segues to a question and answer session that we've ever had. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
There is a microphone. It is behind the podium. I, I, I do encourage you to ask a question to try and keep it as, as brief as possible um, so that as many people can ask them as possible. So we welcome you. I'm curious. I haven't read the Warren Report, but were any people here in New Orleans interviewed for that? And if so, who, who were they? Well, certainly Dean Andrew. That's, that's what my dog did. That's the, the genesis of the whole story was uh, Dean Andrews uh, telling the Warren uh, Commission report of uh, people that this guy Bertrand had called him to represent Oswald, so. I do believe that somebody called him, and I don't believe it was Clay Shaw, but he did start the whole thing. There's no question about it. He said that they came and interviewed him, and uh, they were driving him crazy, and uh, he didn't want to tell them who had called him because the person who called him was a person who sent him a lot of business. And he swore to me before he died that uh, that he was sorry that he had ever said anything about this at all because it never was Clay Shaw and he never even inferred that uh, to the, the FBI or to uh, Garrison. That he never once inferred it. So of the people that they interviewed here, uh, he was probably the most important from the standpoint of uh, kick-starting the garrison investigation. And that's one of my favorite parts in the movie, actually, is your comment that there used to be characters like Dean Andrews all over the city, that it was, it was full of people like that. And that's why I was saying earlier, it just seems like such a right place for this story. Another question. Uh, is there any evidence, this is to the whole panel, I guess, is there any evidence that uh, Shaw knew Oswald or ran into him, all of the all the various locations that Oswald seemed to have turned up in that six months or so, and the kind of the, the you know, dark side of the city that, that Shaw might have been involved in. That's, that's always been an issue for me, a question. Well, other than, you know, the obvious, the International Trade Point leafleting incident, the uh, thing that, that's always struck me, one of the things that's always struck me about people's perception of Shaw was that a lot of folks have, have sincerely and well-meaning come to his defense by saying, oh, he couldn't have hung around with somebody who's just reputable as Oswald, let alone David Ferry. Well, it wasn't that simple. I think, in fact, that he had a, he had a life that very much had room for that kind of association. Yeah. I would just say there's no convincing evidence, as far as I'm concerned, that he ever knew or met Lee Harvey Oswald. I think there is a small amount of evidence that I think the, the vast majority of the evidence says that he did not know David Ferry. I think there's a small amount of convincing evidence that he might have. And I, and I think I would just acknowledge that, but I, I, I've never seen any convincing evidence that he ever met or knew or associated with Lee Harvey Oswald. That's evidence. Well, I would say that um, slightly to rebut what he said, um, Clay, was gay and he did uh, uh, go around uh, with uh, other gay people in his private life but he was a very discerning human being and I cannot I cannot for a moment imagine that he would find himself in the same room with any of this cast of characters uh, except by total accident this is a slightly different thread but uh, one of the alternative theories that I've heard through the years, and I think a lot of other people, is was the mafia involved in this? And That's over the last, I, I'm working on a project of myself, myself, and over the last year or two, I became aware that the American mafia actually starts in New Orleans. Uh, and so with the Matranga family and, and some of their people around them, and so I think, God, is there a connection? Well, I will give you this uh, answer that I think Garrison thought so. And every time uh, any of uh, us reporters would try to suggest that there might have been a mafia connection, uh, he would threaten to, to haul you before the grand jury and have you arrested. You have to remember that Garrison was a mildly venal sort. He, he's, uh, some of his best friends were minor mobsters who owned properties on Bourbon Street. He hung out with working girls. 
he hung out with the wise guys. Um, and so I think that if there was a connection um, in New Orleans of any kind of conspiracy, that that was the direction that it took just because of the way Garrison reacted every time anyone would ever suggest that. Do I think that the local Mafia Dons uh, conspired to kill the president? I doubt it seriously. But I certainly don't think that they would have been above uh, doing a favor for uh, some of their buddies in Miami uh, if they asked for a plane or if they asked for anything. That I don't, I don't think for a minute they would have hesitated to do a favor. There weren't a lot of wise guys mourning Kennedy's assassination. No. Uh, and there's a book called Mafia Kingfish, if you're interested in this, and I don't think it's all thoroughly convincing, but if you want to go down that road. It's a great it's, title. Yeah, yeah it's, it's, it's a it, fun book. And it's about Carlos Marcello, and, and right, Marcello was influential in the city, and um, David Ferry did work as an investigator for uh, Carlos Marcello's lawyer. In fact, um, he was in the courtroom the day that uh, Marcello was um, acquitted of, of, I don't remember what the charges were precisely in that particular case, but he was acquitted and Dave Ferry was there that day and it's the same day the president was assassinated and um, Marcella did have a very serious beef with um, Robert Kennedy who had him deported very unceremoniously. Um, so, I mean, if you want to go down that road, you can draw connections, but again, the evidence is spare. I mean, there, it's easy to speculate, but, um, you know. Uh, but the most likely theory, if there was a conspiracy that had New Orleans elements, the most, likely uh, would have been some mob elements, some teamster elements. Uh, I think y'all have been a, a disparaging of the district attorney and promoter of uh, Bill Shaw, and I really believe it's opposite that. Okay, I think it took a lot of courage for Jim Garrison to do what he did. And I I think that uh, he was on uh, Clay Shaw because Clay Shaw was connected with Oswald and Ferry and Dr. Ashna because Dr. Ashna was the founder of the International Trademark and Clay Shaw was a director. Now, Clay Shaw was also a, me a founder member of this organization called Permindex which had such notables of the, the Bromfields uh, and the Broffmans and some extremists, uh, uh, Richard Nagy. Uh, so I don't know how much investigation that Garrison actually did, but I think that that's why he claimed that Shaw was a conspirator in the assassination. Now, the idea that Oswald uh, kill Kennedy by himself is absurd. I agree. And Garrison claimed that it was a fairy tale. And who actually did it is a lot of a, a lot of opinions. Uh, you can go to uh, YouTube right now and see what uh, John Lear had to say. And he said, John Lear is the guy that created the Lear Jets. He said that it was because Kennedy was trying to stop Israel from getting nuclear weapons. Gaddafi said the same thing, okay? I think that Garrison, uh, it took a lot of courage for him to do what he did, whether he was uh, volatile or not, but he suffered a lot from that. Not I was as much born as in New I Orleans, went to Jesuit High School, Tulane. I, I met Clay Shaw one morning, broad day. I met Garrison and spoke with him a few times. I knew this fellow, Perry Russo, because he actually had a baseball team. Okay, and I used to play baseball and I knew him. Some people called, claimed he was gay. I don't know. Uh, there's a lot of people that have been murdered. Like, why was uh, Ferry murdered? 
He was the murder. That's Joe's view. He was the murder. It was the coroner's view, actually. So what? <laughs> the question, the question that I think this is five, five days after. What does that mean? Right. Uh, it, it's, it's pretty conclusively documented, fairly died of a very aneurysm. Uh huh. Um, yeah. But uh, I just want to say the question that I think doesn't get asked often enough is giving Garrison the benefit of the doubt. What does Clay Shaw, how does Clay Shaw benefit from Kennedy being assassinated? assassinated? What's, what's in it for Shaw? He was just doing yeah, what he was told. He's in the CIA. Because he had sold his soul to the devil. Right. That was his assignment. <laughs> well, again, I've, I've seen no evidence of that particular transaction. Um, so I, I don't know. I just think that's in the realm of belief and again, you, I, I, you know, I would say one thing though, particularly, and I, you know, it was interesting, like watching the movie, and you could hear some people sort of shrugging their shoulders and you know doing the raspberry at certain points in the documentary, and other people doing that, and the and people still have very strongly held views about these things and about Garrison and about Shaw, and and I will say, you know, as a person who spent a fair amount of time looking at Shaw, I, I am sympathetic to him. Um, no, and I don't so think well, I could pursue the, the project were I not. But you know, I would also say, you know, from a civil rights perspective, I'm I'm very dubious about Garrison's record as a district attorney, and, and that to me goes far beyond um, Clay Shaw. And I, and I think he may have gotten into it for for good reasons. I mean, I would agree with Rosemary on this. But if you watch how the press coverage moves up and down over the course of the early days of that investigation, he gets into real trouble with the press all across the nation right before he makes that Shaw arrest. And I think he got into a, into a lot. He was he was in for a penny, in for a pound, and he had to make an arrest. And and I think Shaw was named Clay, and this Clay Bertrand or Clem Bertrand. And I, and I think, you know, and once he was in, he sort of had to keep going. That, that's my point of view. I know we disagree. And we, I think we can disagree amiably. You just, I just, agree with, you just accept the view that's promoted by the media. Uh, no, sir, I don't. Actually, I've spent, you know, a long we're gonna, time we're doing keep research. This, we're so. going to keep this through that microphone yeah. as our exchange. Yeah. One thing I did want to ask that I didn't before was Garrison ends up with a political career that goes on to 1991. I mean, whatever you think um, is one-sided about it, at the current presentation, obviously New Orleans continued in some sense to support him. This, is, this does not damage him politically enough to... To, to put him out of office. No, look at Edwin Edwards. I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's Louisiana. It's, it's Louisiana yeah. way. Yes, I mean, I, I think that that goes back to the issue of tolerance. I think that Louisianians are are extremely tolerant of corruption. I think that as long as they're entertained, they'll let it go on in you know ad nauseum. New Orleans is the only city in the country where people say, "Have a nice weekend on Wednesday." <laughs> I will say at the end of this. Next question. Okay. I remember the uh, early 60s as, you know, was very uh, anti-communist and that, that was the uh, aura and everything. Uh, when Oswald got back from Russia, how was he allowed to, to circulate in, in all these areas that he was? In fact, did he go to Mexico a couple of months before the assassination and try to go to Cuba and Russia? And I, I watched the, the show last night. How can anybody do that at that period of time and just like almost be invisible to you know the people that are supposed to be watching these things? Well, that's that's why I say that I think that he probably was there in Dealey Plaza. He probably it, it took at least one shot, if not all three shots. Uh, he did not get there by himself. He certainly didn't because he had no visible means of support. How did he get to Mexico without money? How did he get anywhere without money? Uh, I think that the thing that worries me so much about um, the garrison uh, mess, I call it, uh, is that it's turned off a lot of legitimate questioning. For example, I was asked up to um, Washington by CNN and was interviewed extensively, and so were a lot of other people, and they produced this two-hour documentary that they've run several times. And to me, I thought they did a great production job, and I think that, that they showed the, all the elements of the assassination itself very well. 
But it was clear to me that the people who produced this film had a mission, and that was, once again, to allay the fears of the public that there had been some sort of conspiracy because they didn't even want to really talk about it. We did talk about it in the interview, but none of that found, uh, found its way into uh, the final uh, production. And so I, I go back to the garrison uh, scenario, and they don't want to get into that can of worms again. You know? And so people who should be legitimately questioning what happened are kind of sick of it. I have a question for Rosemary. Uh, you said Garrison was arrested on assault. Oh, no, but he was accused of assault. Was it in the NOAC, you said? Yes. OK. Was it sexual assault? It was physical? sexual assault. It was sexual assault. That's uh, what I was You know, teenage boy. Okay. There was a, the New Orleans Athletic Club in those days, and far as I know, they still do it. The, 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 everybody swam in the nude. I swam in the nude. But what happened was that then there was a, a, a sleeping room, a nap room, they called it, I think, and that's where this took place. Garrison, uh, according to the to the to the alleged victim, who I believe, uh, I just said that Garrison fondled his genitals. <laughs> And last question will go to our friend Jack McGuire. I, I just want to make one two comments. I was mayor of Mr. Skiro's special assistant press secretary during this, so knew both Clay Shaw and Jim Garrison very, very well. In fact, I had lunch with Jim, uh, I'd rather had lunch with Clay Shaw three days before uh, he was arrested. At that time, which was typical of his interest in the city, the Riverfront Expressway was a real big controversy then, and Clay had come to see Vic to propose to him that while he was absolutely opposed to an expressway, if in fact we were going to have one, he had a proposal to build another Pontalba building across the riverside of the square to finish the square off. And Vic had me go have lunch with him to talk about this. Garrison was mesmerizing. He had crazy eyes. The night of the amendment that passed for the Superdome, Vic and I were in the mayor's suite at the Roosevelt Hotel, and Garrison showed up there, and I got some drinks. And for 90 minutes, he talked about the assassination of Kennedy. This was three months before Rosemary and uh, Jack Dempsey exposed the fact that he was doing so. But he talked about that, and he talked about Cubans, and you know, if you listen to Garrison one-on-one, -on -one, uh, he can be very persuasive until you realize the guy was a nutcase. <laughs> <laughs> a nutcase. He was, he was offered a disability from the Army because of his psychoneurosis, his instability, his personality disorders, and in fact, he turned down the disability from the Army to go into the National Guard instead because he didn't want that type of discharge on his record. He was a political hack who was an assistant prosecutor of traffic court when he got involved with Chuck Morrison, CCDA. Then he ran for criminal court judge. He lost that. He ran against old man Comiskey for assessor because Chuck wanted a fellow in there just to keep the assessor busy while during Chuck's re-election. And he pretty much was, was kind of a minor political figure until he ran for district attorney. One of the interesting things is Urban Diamond, who you saw in this film, was the person who was defeated in that election as well as the incumbent district attorney, Richard Dowd. Garrison should never have been elected uh, district attorney. The only reason he was was that on a televised debate, they were asked, do you intend to be a full-time district attorney? Because it wasn't required. That's right. Dowling said, yes, I'm going to be a full-time. I am now. Garrison, who had so little legal pra practice, said, yes, I'm going to be a full-time. And my, my good friend and neighbor, Urban Diamond, looked at the audience and the cameras, and he said, if you expect me to be full-time for 25 grand a year, go get another boy. <laughs> <laughs> and he lost. He was fake. He lost. And then Garrison went on his crusades against the judges, you know, and everything else. But let's not forget that after all of this and after he destroyed Clay Shaw, he was indicted for bribery when his own investigator, Pershing Gervais, went to the U.S. Attorney, Gerald Gallinghouse, and said Jim was getting three grand a month for the bar operators. 
Okay. So what I think he, I think Curtis later indictment. recanted to you, Rosie. Yeah, because he wanted to come home. Yeah. What happened? Well, the question to Joe was the same guy who, in the 1953 police investigation, was the bag man for his district, and his own colleagues turned against him because he stole the bag and went to New York City uh, with it. So you have this cast of. of and you left out one thing. He wanted to come home again, so he went to the grand jury, and he's the one that started the whole investigation of the police department. Um, well, you know, the, the whole thing is, you know, I'm part of this, though. Clay Shaw was a decent man. People like me, you know, we knew that he was homosexual. We knew that the head of the tourist commission was. We knew the guy over here was. We knew this guy was. It was unspoken. We didn't talk about it because that was people's personal business. And when Bill Alford went and published and gave to the press the news release listing the 67 items that were found in Clay Shaw's bedroom, Part of which were the costumes for the gay Montreal ball that no one knew was even being held at that time. Now it's on the social page, it's on okay? society page. But the fact of the matter is, Garrison was a charlatan, he destroyed a man, he went after you if you were against him or crossed him, and yet he still wound up, after escaping conviction or indictment, sitting on the Court of Appeal and doing his cameo role as the judge in JFK, which totally misrepresented the facts of what happened with Guy Bannister, Jack Martin, and all of those other people. So I think, and I disagree with my friend in the, in the red sweater, I think that if you had to look at these two people, two people, the one who had God's saving grace with him was Clay Shaw. Yeah, right. <laughs> Obviously, there are many other stories for us to pursue yeah. in coming years. Um, and I appreciate all of you and, and what a great audience you are to, to be here for. Thank you so much. Please thank you New Orleans for being here. Stick around and have a drink. I'm sure we have a lot to talk about. Thank you all.